Some viewers may find this disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi my loves. It's Destin Choice, e watching Choice TV. So for today's video, I wanted to come back with another docu, and I wanted to come back and do something different. And for today's video, I really wanted to get on here and talk about black child stars you didn't know passed away. Child stars, like we all know them, had a sense of individuality back then. Back then, there really was no social media, so our sense of representation was through our television screens every week as they graced our screen. Back in the day, child stars were really the kind of people that we could really look up to. Now, child stars of this generation are pretty much the antichrist, and most of them are way too damn grown, behave provocatively, I'm a you little bitch, you a pure bitch, or are way too involved with politics, but that's another video. But I really wanted to get on here and shed some light on the child stars that many of us never really talk about. Every year as their birthdays pass by and as time goes on, it seems like people always forget about these iconic child stars who paved the way for the new generation to come. So for today's video, I wanted to shed light on a few child stars who passed away that many people never talk about or seem to always forget. Now before I get started with this video, I want to make it very clear that I am going to be putting a trigger warning. So if you aren't okay with things regarding death, self-harm, mental health, and so on and so forth, please feel free to click off because this is not the video for you. The death of Yolanda Rose Brown is honestly one of the most infamous situations in R&B history, in my opinion. And honestly, her passing still to this day has never sat right with me. Yolanda Rose Brown, better known by her stage name, Lala Brown, was born on May 20th, 1986 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Maria and William Brown. Lala was of Afro-Mexican descent. Her father was African-American and her mother was Mexican. She is the youngest of five siblings and was incredibly popular in high school. Lala developed a passion for the arts as early as age 8 years old and originally went by the stage name Premier, but later changed it to the alias Lala Brown as early as age 12. Lala built a local fan base in Milwaukee because she actively performed around bars, weddings, events, special ceremonies, and many more. So she had a pretty buzzing fan base at a very young age in Milwaukee. Lala was described by her peers as a rising star and everyone assumed that she would be a star when the time was right. In 2002, when she was 16, Lala Brown gave birth to her daughter, Amira, and that only pushed her to work twice as hard to achieve her dreams. What to do? Hi. I got a little bit coming with it. What's your name, little mama? Amira. After Lala graduated high school, she immediately focused on getting her name out there and frequently traveled back and forth to Atlanta, Georgia in hopes of meeting the right people, networking with the right people, and creating a name for herself within the industry. In 2005, Lala Brown met the sultry R&B star Life Jennings. Life Jennings at the time was the hottest R&B star. Life Jennings was actually holding auditions for his second album, The Phoenix, which was set to release in August of 2006. Lala actually performed in front of him and he immediately was so impressed by her vocals that he actually asked her to get on one of his tracks. And that track ended up being the iconic single, S.E.X. S.E.X was a national success and in my opinion, although it was a success, it doesn't necessarily get the credit it deserves for being such an impactful tune. S.E.X was a coming of age tale about young girls who blossom into puberty and deal with the pressures of giving up their virginity in a hypersexualized society. See so you all kind of things to get in your page. The single actually peaked in the top five in the Hot R&B charts and peaked at number seven on the Billboard Hot 100. It also became the most successful single on Life Jennings' Phoenix album and blew all his other singles out of the water. As Lala Brown's career was booming, she eventually met her boyfriend, Jatan Clayford, also known by his stage name, Kool-Aid, who was known for being the hottest upcoming producer in Milwaukee. Lala and Kool-Aid actively worked together in the industry and shortly started dating as they were making records together and creating creative ideas and a new sound. But unfortunately, things really started to go downhill for Lala. As the single S.E.X was succeeding, she originally was meant to go on a national tour with Live Jennings to promote the Phoenix album and she was actually on board to go on this tour at first. But then Lala and Life actually got into a heated disagreement which then led her to leaving and being booted off the tour for reasons that were never disclosed. What we do know, however, is Life Jennings ended up replacing her with another singer while he was on tour. 
that did start a lot of controversy because if you actually do your research, I found several videos on YouTube from 2006 and 2007 of Life Jennings being on tour without Lala and somebody actually singing her vocals that she wrote. <laughs> No one really knows exactly why she was booted off the tour or why he replaced her with somebody else. All we do know is it might have had to do with a lot of financial disagreements that Life Jennings couldn't comply with. Lala went right back to Milwaukee and she decided to focus on her own solo career and went right into the studio. As Lala's relationship started to become serious with her boyfriend Kool-Aid, and at the time her boyfriend Kool-Aid was living in his music studio, Loud Enough Productions, located at 55th and Lipson Avenue back in 2007. The two actively spent time in the studio creating new sounds, mixes, and music in hope of getting Lala her next hit song. That was honestly their home and they made the most out of it they could. They had a bed and everything in there because that's where they were sleeping and that's where they knew their life was going to change forever. However, sadly, things didn't go too well. Lala and her boyfriend had been missing for almost two days at one point, and both their families actually began worrying to the point where they were all looking for them. Lala and Kool-Aid were found dead, lying in the bed that they shared inside the studio, and from there, the two were pronounced dead on October 19, 2007. Lala was only 21 years old at the time, and Kool-Aid was 22. The firm is stepping up with reward money in hopes of solving the mysterious double murder of an aspiring Milwaukee music star and her boyfriend producer. 12 News reporter Nick Bohr is live at the scene of the crime. It's near 55th in Lisbon, and Nick, have they gotten any kind of leads? Well, they have, Kathy, and police say they are still following up on those leads, but certainly they welcome any new tips. It has been three weeks now since uh, this young couple were shot to death here at this home on the 55th and Lisbon. It was not only their studio, but their home. The October murders of Yolanda Brown and her boyfriend and producer, Jayton Claiborne, inside their studio on Lisbon Avenue shocked their friends, family, and, yes, her fans. The rising R&B star was just coming into her own when they were shot to death. Three weeks later, the signs at their studio are gone. The weather's changing, and there are fears the case, too, has turned cold. She loved the spotlight. There's no doubt about it. She wanted to make it. Yolanda's parents made sacrifices along the way to support her career and were just as thrilled when she recently appeared in a video on BET. But it, it, was, it was worth it because if you listen to some of the music, man, it's, it's really nice. But now someone is stepping forward offering a reward for information who never knew the couple. From what we've learned about uh, this young woman, so talented, so young, uh, in the prime of what was going to be hopefully a successful music career, it kind of just strikes a chord. The law firm, Hupi and Abraham, is putting up $2,500, hoping it will prompt someone to come forward with information. I'm ecstatic. You know, maybe more people will uh, see it and hear it and cool. come forward, you know, because we've done all we can to try to help the police also, you know. And Milwaukee police say they welcome the offer of the reward because it has helped in the past. Anyone with information is asked to call police. That number they want to call is 935-7360. Live at 55th in Lisbon, Nick Four, WISN 12 News. And it was later revealed by the media that days before Lala's death, she actually didn't feel safe. She actually knew her life was in danger, shockingly. Days before she died, Kool-Aid had actually got his studio ransacked and robbed of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. According to Lala's friend, she didn't feel safe at all because she was actively receiving anonymous phone calls of someone telling her she basically needed to watch her back. But on the evening of October 19th, 2007, everything suddenly changed. Relatives were concerned because nobody had heard from Kool-Aid or Lala in several days. And that just wasn't normal. So Kool-Aid's brother Anthony broke into the lock studio to check on it. I kicked in the door. It was an awful smell. You know, um, went to the back room. That's where they lay. That's where we found them. Lala Brown and Jatan Claiborne had been shot to death. In an instant, two lives and their dreams 
life had ended in a surreal nightmare of violence. I said, no, no. I said, no, this can't be. We believe that uh, Lala and Kool-Aid actually knew the perpetrator. There were no signs of forced entry and evidence uh, recovered from the scene uh, revealed that the, uh, that the perpetrator uh, did not force his way into the building. Um, Kool-Aid, he was usually his little upbeat self, but Lala, she was, you could tell something wrong with her. She was like, uh, she was getting like phone calls, threatening phone calls and people hanging up and stuff like that. And threatening whereas, her life? Threatening her life. But she didn't say who? She didn't say who. Yeah. Or if it was a male or female, she never said. And she was actually asking if anybody knew any, you know, apartment listing because she wanted to move from the studio where they were living in. She wanted to move right away because she felt threatened for her life. But she mm -hmm. said that three days before she died. Who had threatened Lala's life is a big part of this mystery. When you lose a child, it cuts your heart. You know, it's it's hideous. You know, it's. Like one minute I'll be smiling and then the next minute I feel like I, I can't walk. As of now, it's officially been 12 years since Lala was tragically murdered with her boyfriend Kool-Aid and her parents, right along with Kool-Aid's family, are still seeking justice. Back in 2016, however, it was believed that they had a suspect in custody after all these years, but he was believed to already be in prison, out of state, and doing time for another crime. Despite being told that they might have another suspect, the family was never alerted of an alleged suspect ever again after that one update. But as of now, no charges were made due to a lack of tangible evidence. So as of now, Lala still doesn't have any justice and we don't even know if that one person who they assumed was a suspect in 2016 was the one that murdered her because there's not enough tangible evidence. Recently, Kool-Aid's mother recently held a memorial in Milwaukee celebrating the anniversary of his death. this day, no one has been charged. I would love to have justice for these two because somebody out here knows what happened. Even without justice, family and friends keep their legacy alive. The state legislature honored Jatan and Lala when it declared June as Wisconsin's Black Music Month. The one thing that I want everybody watching this to gain from the situation regarding Lala is the hood really doesn't want you to succeed. It doesn't matter how you make it out. It doesn't matter what you do. Everybody just seems to have this crabs in a bucket mentality. That's why I always say you need to leave the hood when the time is right. Because due to the crabs in the bucket mentality, people in your city don't really want to see you win. If you guys actually want to check out her music, it's available on Apple Music. And her daughter, Amira, actually is now 19 years old, all grown up. And she actually has a YouTube channel where she vlogs her life. And she's now dabbling into the music scene. She also makes video frequently talking about her mother, talking about her memories, and also keeping her mother's name alive. Apparently she has a documentary that she's working on about her mother's life, but there's still no update yet. That's my dad in the background, so that's one of the things I've been working on is the documentary. If you guys don't know, my mother is Lala Brown for any of you viewers tuning in right now. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I took on the name Lil Lala. She gave me that name. So I'm sticking with it. and. Not only for her, but it's something that I truly want to do for my heart. But my dad has so many, like, letters that my mom wrote him when they were in high school. And it's just amazing about all the stuff that I'm going through. So feel free to go over to her YouTube channel, subscribe, and show her support. And there's also a lot of, you know, positive benefits to, to really dedicating yourself to something like that and, and achieving something in it, you know? So, you know, it's, it balances itself out, you know? Lean Thompson Young, if you guys didn't know, was an American actor born on February 1st, 1984 in Columbia, South Carolina. Lee Thompson Young got his start in the performing arts, playing in his local talent shows as a kid. At the age of 12, Lee Thompson Young and his mother moved to New York City and he began to audition professionally and he eventually got discovered by several agencies. After a year in New York City, Lee Thompson Young built up a huge enough fan base and a hefty resume that solidified his spot in New York City. In 1997, Lee Thompson Young reached the pinnacle of his career when he auditioned to star in his own show, The Famous Jet Jackson, which to this day is probably his most notable role. The Famous Jet Jackson first aired 22 years ago on October 25th, 1998. The show was about a young black teenager who was trying to adjust to fame, the Hollywood life, high school, dating, and being one of the hottest actors in the world. 
The show was a show within a show and was based on the behind the scenes life of a young actor. Many people don't even know this, but it was actually the first ever drama series to air on Disney Channel ever. Not to mention, it was Disney Channel's first ever series with a lead black character and a black family. The series even had an extensive budget with a long list of A-list celebrities as guest stars such as Britney Spears, Rachel McAdams, Eartha Kitt, and even Beyonce appeared on the show. It's Rob, right? That was gutsy. Stupid, <laughs> but gutsy. I'm Beyonce. The show ran on for three seasons from 1998 and was canceled on June 2nd, 2001. And the reruns played on Disney Channel Network up until the year 2004. Once the show was canceled, it immediately was given its own movie as a way to give closure to the fans, making it one of the first ever Disney Channel movies to be based on an actual series. Lee Thompson Young quickly moved on with his life and career and went on to pursue other endeavors in the industry. His career was pretty much booming and he has appeared in over a hundred different shows and he even starred as a lead character in three major films. And he also went on to pursue a higher education. He attended the University of South Carolina and graduated with a bachelor's in film and cinematic arts in the year 2007. And Lee was also a member of the Kappa fraternity while he was in college. In 2009, Lee Thompson Young then would score his biggest role to date as Detective Barry Frost on the TNT series Rizzolian Isles. Unfortunately, that would be his last role to date because in August of 2013, Lee Thompson ended up going missing. It was very odd to a lot of people because it wasn't like him to not check up with family and friends. He was actually scheduled to show up for one of his scenes, but he ended up never showing up. Lee Thompson was then found in his apartment dead by one of his friends. The Los Angeles Police Department confirming actor Lee Thompson Young was found dead in Los Angeles just a couple of hours ago. Uh, he starred in Disney's The Famous Jet Jackson, currently uh, has been starring in the TNT show called Rizzoli and Isles. And I just want to read part of a statement from TNT uh, and Warner Brothers to us here. Everyone at Rizzoli and Isles is devastated by the news of the passing of Lee Thompson Young. We are beyond heartbroken at the loss of this sweet, gentle, good-hearted, intelligent man. He was truly a member of our family. After he took his own life and committed suicide with his registered handgun in his Los Angeles apartment. Lee Thompson Young committed suicide in his Los Angeles apartment during a manic episode and his body was found days later in his bedroom. He was only 29 years old. That was a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow because no one really had any idea that he suffered from manic episodes. Lee's mother, Velma Love, eventually broke her silence and she told the public that Lee Thompson had struggles with his mental health ever since he was a teenager. In his late teenage years, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, and I noticed some periods of sadness um, and that stabilized quickly. He would sometimes call me and, you know, say he was feeling a little sad, but um, again, it was always a, a quick, you know, recovery. According to USC psychiatrist Dr. Ashley Jones, Lee's diagnosis isn't uncommon. 2.6% of U.S. adults are affected by bipolar disorder annually. It was very different than kind of the normal ups and downs that we have during the day. The depressive episodes usually last about two weeks, and with that we see depressed mood, hopelessness, sadness. With mania, they're often um, euphoric or grandiose with high self-esteem. But with medication and therapy, Lee continued on his road to success. The roles got bigger. By 29, Lee was a regular on another popular TV show. In August of 2013, something changed. After we learned that Lee had been found dead in his apartment due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound, we of course were stunned. I guess, you know, that's the question that everyone would ask and we really don't know those answers and there's really there's no way to know. However, despite her getting him diagnosed back when he was a teenager, she still had no idea how severe Lee's bipolar disorder was because she admits that she was actually very ignorant to mental illness. A lot is not known about it. There's some mystery around it. And she said a person can appear to be well, but they can be Shows that one in five people uh, diagnosed with a uh, who live with bipolar disorder within their lives. 
if that had been part of my conscious awareness, I think um, I and my family would have been more visible. Um, I remember two years ago, my son said, oh, I think I'll purchase a gun because I like to go to the shooting range and do target practice. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And I, I didn't say anything else about it. And he didn't say anything else about it. He did, he, he did say, why do you think I might become delusional? And I said, it hurt myself. And I said, well, that's entirely possible. But if I had known that one in five people who, who suffer from bipolar disorder in their lives, I, I would have pushed more against my own concerns. So she figures since he didn't show any frequent symptoms or since he was hiding it so well and since he was on medication, she figured everything was fine. As of now, his mother currently runs an organization dedicated and named after him called the Lee Thompson Young Foundation. The purpose of the foundation is to globally travel the world and educate the youth about the vicious cycles of undiagnosed mental illness. His mother now dedicates her life to speaking at events and encouraging young people to seek mental health evaluation immediately and early before it's too late. Hi. I'm Velma Love. I am the mother of Lee Thompson Young. Last summer, my son committed suicide. He suffered from bipolar disorder. While I knew this because he had been in therapy and had suffered for a number of years, his closest friends and associates did not. He suffered in silence. He did not want people to know because of the stigma associated with mental illness. So in our healing, my family and I have established the Lee Thompson Young Foundation to help people know more about mental illness and mental health and well-being, to help remove the stigma associated with mental illness. She currently runs a YouTube channel where she talks about her son and where she also educates people about mental health and the issues surrounding it in the African-American community. Feel me now. See what I believe is. We was granted power. <laughs> What's that about what? Woo! The power to make all you dance. The teen of Tijuana Reed was an R&B vocalist, dancer, songwriter for the group TLC, actress, and former member of the short-lived R&B group, Black. She was born on October 28, 1980 in New York City, but raised in Atlanta, Georgia with both her parents, who were heavily in the church. At the age of eight, Natina started her career in the entertainment industry as a campaign model for the brand Macy's, and she would later develop a huge passion for the arts, acting, and singing, and songwriting at the age of 12. At 15, Natina was actually discovered by Ronald Lopez in 1995, who at the time was a talent scout for his oldest sister, whom we all know as Lisa Left Eye Lopez. Left Eye went on to mentor Natina Reed, and the two eventually came up with the idea of starting Natina's solo career, which then led to the idea of them starting a girl group for Natina. And Left Eye eventually released their first ever single in 1999 called 808. And it became their most successful single to date. And the single sold over 500,000 copies overnight. And Left Eye wanted to make sure that the group was the spitting image of her vision. Natina quickly became the fan favorite because people kept comparing her to Left Eye. And everybody knows Left Eye pretty much was a fan favorite in TLC. Black toured the entire world performing that song 808. And as they built more and more momentum and as the song climbed the charts and stayed on the charts for weeks, following that, there was a great anticipation for them to release their first ever debut album. And obviously the album took off with singles like I Do and Bring It All To Me featuring NSYNC, making the album go platinum in just a few months. The group later signed a multi-million dollar deal with Beacon Pictures and appeared alongside Gabrielle Union in the cult classic Bring It On. Natina became the most memorable character because her character, Janelope, had the most iconic lines throughout the film. Really? You ready to share those trophies? Can we just beat these buffies down so I can go home? I'm on curfew, girl. Natina not only starred in the film, but she also co-wrote, produced, and even made a soundtrack for the film that we all know as As If. So, eventually, they decided to release their second album in 2002. The album, however, was constantly pushed back because Left Eye's management, whom they were signed to at the time, actively kept releasing singles back to back to back to back and the public wasn't gravitating towards any of the lead singles. The first album did exceptional, but the second album, they didn't know how well it would do. In fact, their second lead single that came out, Can't Get It Back, was released 
and the label sent it out to several radio stations and the single flopped within the airwaves and the fans failed to gravitate towards it. So the album was pretty much released in Asia and their label refused to release it in America. They were losing their momentum, their sales were going down, ticket sales weren't selling as much and as time was going on, since they released it in Japan, they saw that barely anybody bought it in Asia. And as nobody bought it in Asia, they then realized what's the point of releasing it? So the label pretty much felt as though that if they were to release it in America, you know, help them set up meet and greets, tour tickets, and so on and so forth, they were terrified that they wouldn't get a return on their investment. A few months after the album's release in Asia, Left Eye tragically passed away. And as we all know, Left Eye tragically passed away in a tragic car crash in Honduras. And unfortunately, that was really the beginning of the end for Black. And Left Eye was one of the few people who actually believed in them. Left Eye's death was very hard for Natina Reed, and it took a huge toll on her art and her career, and it made her never want to be seen ever again. After that, Natina Reed took a huge hiatus from the industry and the spotlight, and she completely disappeared to focus on her family, considering at the time, Natina Reed had actually just found out that she was pregnant. Uh, Natina, let me start with you. Uh, here was a woman who, who saw your talent, who embraced you, brought you into the fold, and was not only like a sister to you, but a mentor musically. Yeah, I love Lisa very much. Baby, we're going to try to celebrate this as best we can. So let, let, me, let me try if I can get you to, to tell us when you'll think about her and what makes you smile about her most. <laughs> I was just telling Rashawn about how every night um, me and Lisa would just laugh and talk about old memories or whatnot. We was living together previously um, within the last three months right before my son was born. And um, Lisa was just the most kindest person on this earth, you know. She had a lot of questions about life. Um, she was very curious, like a child. She was innocent, you know. She never, um, she never understood certain things, and she had a lot of questions that was unanswered. I always told her that she had a very big heart, and that I hope that one day somebody will give back to her the way she has given to many other people, including myself. Um, she took very good care of me while I was pregnant, and. But after left eye passed away their contract ended up going into the wrong hands and they pretty much lost all creative control as they were working on their third album, Torch. Natina then decided to walk away from the group because she felt as though that the group was holding her back and the damage had already been done. She needed to move on if she wanted to actually pursue something in her career. So the group ended up breaking up in 2008 and Natina went on to pursue a career in the film industry. As time went on, Natina then focused on her life and she ended up focusing on her kid. She then surrounded her life to Jesus Christ and she actively dedicated her life to spreading the word of God and she traveled the world to many cities and held many seminars, preaching and singing gospel. But that was very short lived as Natina Reed's life pretty much started to go into shambles. She then started suffering from severe depression and developed a massive drinking problem because her career was starting to fall off the hinges like never before. Natina was also dealing with ageism in the music industry and she felt as though that people weren't taking her seriously because because Natina had finally reached her 30s and everyone knows that in the industry when you reach your 30s everyone pretty much tells you that you're not good enough, you're aging out and since you're not young people don't really care about you. And as time went on, as we all know, Natina Reed infamously had several run-ins with the law because she frequently allowed her drinking problem and her mental health to get the best of her. Back in 2011, Natina Reed was allegedly arrested for drug possession and prostitution. But according to her team, the claims of her drug possession and prostitution charges were completely false and exaggerated and actually weren't completely what the truth was. So no one really has any idea about that. Then a few months later, Natina was arrested for public drinking with an open container of alcohol in the state of Georgia and she was charged with disorderly conduct for drinking in public and disturbing the peace. Then a year later, Natina Reed was arrested again after she got too drunk and she physically assaulted someone after a verbal altercation on May 11, 2012. As months went on, Natina Reed then ended up being homeless. She ended up living in and out of motels, leaving her son behind and her fiance of 8 years. And as time went on, she was even planning on pitching a reality TV series featuring her and her fellow groupmates talking about the aftermath of their life and the group. Then that same year, tragedy struck. On October 26, 2012, Natina Reed was tragically killed two days before her 32nd birthday by a red Honda Accord while she was walking in the middle of the street. 
and officers actually still have no clue to this day why she was crossing the road considering this was late in the day and most of the surrounding shops were actually closed at this time. The driver who hit Natina actually tried to perform CPR shortly after calling 911 and calling an ambulance, but at one point, it was too late. She was pronounced dead 29 minutes later in the hospital due to the impact of the car. The driver who hit Natina was never charged because it was believed that her death occurred in a sense of negligence on her part. Natina Reed was only 31 years old at the time of her death and her family had asked the media to leave them alone and please let them grieve in privately. Despite Natina Reed passing away, we can all honestly learn a lot from the events that occurred in her life. And the simple answer is, alcohol is not the answer. I don't really know her situation, and a lot of us of course don't know her situation. Suppressing your pain is like putting a bandage on a scar, and obviously that doesn't get you anywhere. What really helps a scar fade away is time and treatment. It is kind of tragic and a little bit fishy how she died the same exact way her mentor left I died. I always found that very weird, and that never really sat right with me how she died the same way Left Eye did. But Left Eye is a whole other video. What are some of the uh, up and coming things we can look forward to watching you in? Look out for that. As for anything else, it's in the future. I can't call it. Keep an eye out. Merlin Santana doesn't necessarily need an introduction because we all remember him as Romeo Santana from the WB original series, The Steve Harvey Show. But for those of you guys who don't remember Merlin Santana, let me give you guys a nice brief reminder of who he is. Merlin Santana was born March 14, 1976 in the heights of New York City with two immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. His name Merlin was actually inspired by the mythical 1964 Disney Channel character Merlin the Magician. The name Merlin was actually given to him originally by his mother because according to her, Merlin was born prematurely. He almost didn't make it and he was born within five months of being in the womb. So his mother decides to name him after Merlin the Magician because she felt like his existence was magical. As Merlin got older, his parents got him heavily involved in the arts, entertainment, and in school because they wanted him to stay out of trouble and they didn't want him getting involved with the wrong crowd since he was growing up in the heights of New York City. And there was no telling what could have happened to him had he went down the wrong path and had he hung around the wrong people. In the 1990s, Merlin was discovered by a talent agency when he was just a child, and from there, his career took off as early as the age of 10 years old in New York City. By the time Merlin was 10 years old, he appeared in over 15 commercials, and his career quickly took a turn after being discovered by Bill Cosby, to where he would be granted a role as Stanley in The Cosby Show, which later led him to the role as Ronald Griggs in the original Law & Order. From there, Merlin has had several cameos as a recurring cast member on shows like Getting By, Sweetheart, let's dance. Come on. Let's not. So it's like that, huh? It's the way you made it, bruh. Poop. <laughs> That's right. Because if you mess with my girl again, you go have to deal with the killer gang. You want to dance? Sure. Ron and Maggie aren't strangers living upstairs. He's my brother, and now he's yours. So why don't you just cut the attitude? I was born with an attitude, all right? I just wasn't born part of this family. So what? You know, the only person who's treating you like a foster child, Marcus, is you. Something happens to you, it matters to us. We want to know about it. Well, sometimes I just don't feel like telling everybody everything, okay? Well, you never have a problem telling me everything. <laughs> That's because you think it's everything. Mr. What's that? Mom, he thought we were one person, and he asked both of us out. Uh-oh, custody battle. No. <laughs> Could you excuse us, please? <laughs> I can't wait till that triplet gets home. Oh, it's three of them. <laughs> By the time Merlin Santana turned 20 years old, he had reached the pinnacle of his career when he starred alongside Steve Harvey as Romeo in the Steve Harvey show. The series led him to mainstream stardom, and the series lasted for six years on the WB. Not to mention, Merlin was actually thoroughly proud of his Dominican culture, and he also wanted the world to know that there was other Latinos that looked just like him, so he made sure to incorporate tons of Spanish into his work. Wait a minute. Two tickets to see Lauren Hill, and all I have to do is show around your dorky niece. <laughs> dorky, that's Dominican slang for she fine. Hold on a minute. Mira, este es mi nieto. El papá de él fue el que tú casi le metiste una vara. Así que no enseñe la cara por aquí, o la cosa se va a poner heavy, mi hermano. ¿Tú me estás oyendo? Yeah, I act like you know. What did you just say to him? Oh, I just said you were my brother's son, and we lived in this house. We were family, stuff like that. When did you learn to talk like that? My mom. She was Dominican. And eventually, as time went on, he eventually moved to Los Angeles to pursue his career in music and to further his career in the acting world. But unfortunately, 
He didn't necessarily live to see these things through, and he didn't necessarily live to see the potential of his career and where it could have gone. Merlin Santana was tragically murdered on November 9th, 2002. He was with his childhood friend and fellow actor, Brandon Adams, when two gunmen named Damian Andre Gates, who was 21 years old, and Brandon Bynes, who was 25 years old in the city of Crenshaw, California, when he was killed. The entire scenario was actually reenacted in a documentary called Celebrity Crime Files, and they reenacted the whole situation to give us a play-by-play -play basis of how things actually went down. For actor Merlin Santana and his friend Brandon Adams, it was a frightening nightmare come to life. A dark street, a sketchy neighborhood, and two unknown gunmen closing in. Merlin Santana really had no idea that there were two young men running up on them uh, with guns. Brandon pulled away and was driving away. He looked over at his friend Merlin Santana and noticed that he had been shot. Yeah, man, it's gonna be all right, man. Just hold on. And then there was a large amount of blood on his head. Merlin! Merlin, man! Right about that moment, there was a marked LAPD unit that just happened to be driving by. Mr. Adam flagged down the police unit and there we begin our crime scene. Detectives immediately retrieve Merlin's cell phone. We learned that Mr. Santana was speaking with somebody minutes prior to the shooting. And of course, we wanted to know who this person was. That person, of course, is Mercedes. Brandon tells police about Merlin's call to her and how she showed up for a few minutes, then left. That was interesting and, and odd and of course we had to go down that avenue here so, who is this person detectives have brandon call mercedes later that morning to ask if she'll meet him at a nearby restaurant what are you doing later on today around like one amazingly she agrees anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law when she came to meet brandon adams I mean, you understand the detectives were there waiting and the detectives detained her The interrogation with this young lady did not start very well. You realize you're in a lot of trouble here. I didn't do anything. She is a very street savvy lady. And she, she's had a number of lies. I've never seen anybody or heard anybody get shot. It just wasn't matching up. Her story kept changing. I don't really know anybody else that was there. And we couldn't figure out why was she lying. What is your name? Hadon Tamika Taylor. What is your name? Mercedes Brown. She lied about her name, her date of birth. She said she was 21, and uh, she looked it. She looked 21. I was, I was surprised when we found out that she was, in fact, 15 years of age. Within a few hours, police learn her real name. So what is your name? Monique King. She's Monique King, a 15-year-old runaway from a juvenile facility. Listen, you can either be a suspect or a witness. It's your choice. I didn't do anything. She finally came forward, told us what had transpired prior to the shooting. She called me to go to the party and bang me in the pool. Armed with Monique King's cell phone, detectives followed the electronic trail. It leads them to one of Monique's friends, a man named Damien Gates. When police raid his house, they find at least one 30 caliber bullet, exactly the same as the casings from the crime scene. Also at the house is another man named Brandon Bynes, the second suspect in the case. Mercedes King was a 15-year-old rebellious runaway teenager, and her boyfriend at the time was Damien Gates who was the gunman that actually pulled the trigger that killed Merlin. Damien was told by Mercedes that Merlin had sexually assaulted her at a get-together, and once her boyfriend caught wind of these claims, he instantaneously told her to set him up. Merlin went to his car, and as he went to his car, they thought it was the perfect opportunity to blow fire and shoot at Merlin and his friend in hopes of murdering both of them. But Merlin was the only one who actually caught the bullet in the midst of the shootout. Merlin's death stirred a ton of controversy because people weren't too keen of the allegations of him allegedly messing around with a teenage girl in his villa. Now, a lot of people don't really know if these allegations are actually true. According to Merlin's family, they have frequently denied it and they have frequently said that it was all lies and speculation. But 
No one really knows exactly what Mercedes had to say because she never really came out in the statement. All we do know is her story didn't add up when cops questioned her when they got the opportunity to. They all faced hefty, hefty fines and the judge held nothing back. Damien Gates was the one who actually shot Merlin in the head and Damien was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences plus 70 years to life in prison. Meanwhile, his friend Brandon Bynes actually missed the shot that he aimed at Merlin. So due to that, he was only sentenced to 23 years in prison. It actually took a year and a half for Merlin to get justice. Merlin was murdered in 2002, but they weren't sentenced until 2004. Mercedes unfortunately did not receive the same hefty energy that her boyfriend and his friend got. Instead, since she was 15 years old, they believed that she was a juvenile who went down the wrong path. They found out that she was a lost soul, a young girl, a runaway, and apparently her mother was a prostitute. The judge only gave 15-year-old Mercedes King 10 years in juvenile detention hall for her involvement. As of now, the two gunmen who shot at Merlin Santana are currently doing time in prison in the state of California. And as of now, the woman, Mercedes King, is 33 years old and she is pretty much out in the streets living her life. She was able to get out of jail within the year of 2009 and she immediately got herself right back into trouble. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to stay out of trouble because within the first year of Mercedes being out in the streets in 2011, Mercedes resulted into selling her body for prostitution. Then in 2012, when she was in her 20s, she was arrested again on counts of prostitution and she served 20 days in prison and was later released. She was then arrested again on March 10th, months later in 2012 in Hollywood, California for a violation of her probation. She is now 33 years old and no one really has any idea where she is or how she looks. But we'll never know what she's doing. All we do know is it's a little bit unfair and a little bit fucked up how this woman was able to lure Merlin Santana to danger and she didn't get a hefty sentencing. Unfortunately, when Merlin Santana was murdered, he left behind his on-again, off-again girlfriend and his family. He also left behind his four-year-old daughter at the time, who was named Melinda Santana. As of present day, Merlin Santana's daughter, Melinda Santana, is now all grown up. She's currently 23 years old and she recently graduated college with a bachelor's in nursing. As of now, his younger brother Melky currently has a YouTube channel with his girlfriend and they both oftentimes tell stories about Merlin and oftentimes make videos dedicated to his legacy and tell stories about him. They currently have a kid together and they also named him after Merlin. If you guys want, feel free to subscribe to his brother's YouTube channel and feel free to subscribe. Peters is just like, get down, let's do this, baby. And so when when, when, it, when she says action, it's action. And then like, of course, a lot of people all over the, the world is going to be watching this. Ever since the 1960s and throughout the years, Michael Jackson has always and will be credited for creating the blueprint of pop music from his fashion statements, choreography, and timeless music. And with that kind of success, Michael Jackson has had several actors attempt to betray him in several scripted films. <laughs> I need a smoother transition for the last number. What? Are you nuts? You see what's happening out there? You're amazing. It was an amazing show. They love you. And as long as they keep buying the albums, we love them. It's not about the money, Ziggy. Everything's about the money, right? Not for me or for them. Now we all know that there was only one actor to ever live that could ever pull off Michael. But the only actor to ever dominate the role as Michael Jackson is Wiley Draper. He's the first and only actor to ever pull off Michael Jackson in a performance. Wiley Hughes Draper was born on May 5th, 1969 in West Virginia. Wiley Draper had a keen eye for the entertainment industry and he seemed destined for stardom. When Wiley Draper was younger, his older brother Desmond would throw parties at a local skating ring where Wiley would dance in front of everyone just like Michael Jackson. He also was oftentimes compared to Michael Jackson. Even as a child, many people always pointed out his strong resemblance to Michael Jackson. But as Wiley grew older, his focus on the arts shifted as a teen. He later became a football player at Northside High School, but he changed his focus again back to the arts his sophomore year. Wiley Draper would eventually get accepted into Point Park College in 1990 to master the craft of performing arts. During the summers, Wiley Draper utilized his talent and he was actually the lead dancer at Disney World. Around the age of 21, as Wiley was pursuing acting again, he winded up winning the role as adult Michael Jackson in the television film The Jacksons, An American Dream. He actually initially auditioned for Michael Jackson and was handpicked immediately personally by Michael Jackson due to the easy resemblance and due to the impersonation that he did of Michael Jackson. Wiley Draper not only portrayed Michael, but he became Michael Jackson. And Wiley was even nominated for an Emmy Award the same year. 
He was even personally handpicked and hired by Michael Jackson the same year to participate in the critically acclaimed music video, Remember the Time. Wiley Draper was honestly a rising star, but sadly, his fame quickly dwindled and became short-lived. In fact, much shorter than we all expected. Wiley Draper ended up passing away literally a year after the film was released due to the health complications he was dealing with. Wiley Draper had been battling and losing his fight to a very rare blood cancer called leukemia since he was a child. Leukemia is a cancer of blood forming tissues hindering the body's ability to fight infections. Leukemia can also interfere with the body's production of bone marrow and can lead to a variety of life threatening symptoms. Wiley sadly passed away at the age of 24 years old on December 20th, 1993 literally a year and some change after the film, The American Dream of the Jacksons was released. A year after his death, his family actually created a huge foundation for him called the Wiley Draper Foundation. The Wiley Draper Foundation created by his family was actually dedicated to the continuation of Wiley's legacy of artistic excellence by supporting young aspiring artists through an annual memorial scholarship in his loving memory. The foundation is also a passionate outlet about raising awareness for cancer treatment and raising awareness for bone marrow donation, especially in the African American community where bone marrow is a very, very limited thing for many transplants to have. Thank you guys for watching this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me just say that although a lot of these child stars were gone very, very soon, one thing that we can all admit is that these child stars played a huge role in our life and they played a pivotal role on raising us through the television screen. Child stars used to be the shit back then. It's unfortunate that people always forget about these child stars because I noticed that as their birthdays go by, as their anniversaries go by, no one ever really talks about them. So I want to do this video just to bring awareness about them, talk about them, and just take you guys down memory and nostalgic lane. That was that for this video. If you guys want to see a part two to this, be sure to let me know because there's plenty of child stars that I couldn't squeeze into this video because this video would have been two hours long. Be sure to join my Patreon if you guys are interested. Follow me on Instagram. And that's that. Choice out this bitch. If you haven't already, take out your phone and follow me on Instagram right now. Right now. Thanks. Ooh, you're bright light. You're beautiful see. I choose to be happy. You and I would wait like diamonds in the sky. What hope? What hope? What hope? A vision of ecstasy. What hope? Well, I like diamonds in the sky. Shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. Oh, yeah. Shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond. You're beautiful like diamonds in the sky.